You're about to watch a great interview on TYT interviews. If you want to watch them live, members are the only ones who get to do that. TYTnetwork.com slash join, become a member, enjoy the interviews as they happen. Guess what kind of interview we have, you got it, an awesome one. I almost dropped a pen, but I didn't. Okay, <laughs> Jennifer Jaje is here. She is a Palestinian American actor and comedian and is now in the center of controversy. Uh, cooked up by uh, <laughs> some sort of canary in a coal mine right wing group, uh, and and it turns out you have you are charged with the crime of being Palestinian American. Absolutely. Okay. All right. So I, I just want the audience to be clear about right, that because that is a significant charge. Uh, so uh, as we usually do on TYT interviews, let's break it down. Okay. Let's go all the way back to the beginning. Um, so I, I, I like to know how people grew up. So okay. where were you born? Where'd you grow up? Yeah. I grew up in San Francisco, California. Sounds very, dangerous um, already. Very scary. It actually yeah. was a little bit scary, <laughs> probably for the reason, not the same reasons people think. Right. But um, I grew up in San Francisco. I went to high school there. I went to UCLA. Okay, um, hold. What, what did you do in high school? Uh, any sports, any band? Uh. No, I was like really like dark and emo and was like, everything sucks. And but got straight A's and was like a super nerd who like took every every, you sound every elective. A like <laughs> someone from San Francisco and B like a total immigrant. Okay, like I'm like all emo, like but- Like a total immigrant. The, right. But the, mom and dad, don't get me wrong, I'm getting straight A's. And I'm getting straight, and I'm like <laughs> freaking out if I right. get an A minus. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. I'm trying to do that to my kids now, make them freak out yeah. if they get an A minus. Yeah. Um, it's it's an immigrant thing, you wouldn't understand. Actually, a lot of you would. Um, okay, so then at some point you do a show called I Heart Hamas and other things I'm afraid to tell you. Uh, that turns out to be, a, a, you could describe it as a tragic comic solo show and you mm -hmm. tour that for five years. Yeah. Uh, you've got a lot of uh, interesting folks attached to it, directed by Kamau Bell. Yes. Okay, so that's badass. Yeah, and it was badass. I yeah, mean, so but that's not when people freaked out when you did a show called I Heart Hamas. <laughs> okay, people did freak out, but it was like low key freak out. You okay, know? Uh -huh. um, I mean when we did the show, we went back and forth debating. Okay, do we? This was two thousand eight, so Hamas had a lot a different. Uh, well, a different uh, reputation at the time. I mean, they had just been elected. Mm -hmm. Democratically, as the government right. in Gaza. And, oh, right, right, right. Um, it's also the association that people assume, like, oh, you're Palestinian, you must be a terrorist, and like, mm -hmm. what is a Palestinian terrorist? Hamas. So it was a play on a lot of you know things, but um, but then people saw the show and it got great reviews. So even if there was some sort of hesitation, and Kamal was attached to it, which helped a lot. Um, yeah. It does, it does. When there's a big yeah. name attached to it, people go, oh, it must be okay. Well, he wasn't a big name yet. <laughs> yeah, that's true. That's he wasn't true. a big name but yet. But yeah. still. Um, so at the time, we did have, I mean, we would get email death threats. We would, some theaters backed out and said, you know what, we're not sure we can do this because of pressure from our board members or kind of a sense that maybe it was a little too hot at the time. Well, that is a bit tragicomic uh, because. The irony of them saying, uh, I think you might be supporting terrorists, so I will murder you. Right. Um, I think you might have missed something in there, right? Right, right. right. right, right. <laughs> uh, or even really threatening to shut down the show. Uh, right. And then, you know, especially when they're right wingers who claim that they're hugely in favor of free speech. Well, Unless it, you disagree with the right wing government yeah, of Israel, yeah, of course. Yes, of course. I mean, at the time it was. Um, we had really, considering the title of the show and the content of the show, um, we had very little pushback. And by that, it was like, oh, well, we get an email death threat like once a month or something. You know, no, it's, no. Like, it's you know, not so. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, oh, it's another it's email like, death threat. It's okay. just another email death threat. Uh, yeah. Um, so I can't get over how funny <laughs> and ridiculous that is. Yeah, you yeah, terrorist, yeah. I'm gonna murder you. Yeah, exactly. Right? Exactly. Okay. What? Yeah. <laughs> or because we're not even gonna come to the show and then critique what you're doing, we're just gonna shut down the show. Yeah. That was which I find to be a really interesting like what you're doing is so dangerous, 
we can't let anybody hear it. So yeah, um, yeah. So now you then got attacked for it this year, which is weird. We'll get back to that in a second, yeah. okay? Yeah. But first, uh, and and by the way, you should know Jennifer's uh, been a comedy store, Laugh Factory. She's gonna be at the Laugh Factory this Sunday. You're gonna go to jenniferjaj.com. That's gonna be in a dis link in the description box somewhere. You're gonna see all of her tour dates, and it's, and if you have an open mind, you're gonna go and etc. Okay. Uh, but also television debut on the Emmy winning Amazon show Transparent, okay? And and it goes on and on. So, but what, but in terms of the controversy around your solo show, so what was in it? So it's the title is, yes, yes like, so whoa, like, terrifying. yeah, I wouldn't have done that title, well, okay? Right. But I'm not a comedian, so, but right. like, so that it's jarring, right? Right. Okay, so what was in the show? Well, the show was, uh, it was 90 minutes. I played 20 characters. A lot of the characters, some of the characters are myself, just through different age ranges. And it's just, is it somewhat comedic, somewhat sad, <laughs> nostalgic uh, um, portrayal of like what it feels like to grow up as an outsider, but to grow up as, which is like a very typical immigrant experience, but to grow up as an outsider that carries this like dangerous identity. When mm -hmm. you're like a kid who's like, I just wanna, you know, play whatever, I just wanna eat Pop Rocks and hang out with my friends and like be emo. Like I don't, mm -hmm. and then people are like, but what about your people? And you're like, I'm 14, like I don't know what, like, <laughs> I don't know what you expect me to say. So right. it, it was kind of an, a comedic exploration of like what it feels like to carry this kind of identity. And funny, I played funny characters who uh, I came into contact with in life who were, you know, giving me a hard time or situations like audition situations where they're like, you, okay, we're gonna cast you as this Mexican. I got cast in this um, commercial to play a Mexican. It was like a Mexico tourism commercial, but then they found out I wasn't Mexican. So then they were like, what are you? You know, so it's these really <laughs> funny situations. I feel like the whole internet is yelling that at me at all times. Right. What are you? Yeah, I mean, understandable, <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> understandable. Indeed. Um, so now, back in 2008, it, it was an interesting moment because George Bush had called for elections in Palestine. Mm -hmm. uh, and then when Hamas won, uh, the knucklehead was surprised. Yeah, uh, We were not, so we were on the air at the time and we weren't surprised. We we're like, well, of course Hamas is gonna win yes. uh, because they're the ones that are promising to fight back against their enemies uh, most. So like, and people like that. It's a it's by a right. populist movement, and they're living in an open air prison in in the Gaza Strip, right? And let alone West Bank, etc. Right? They won in the Gaza Strip, uh, and um, well, they won overall, and then uh, yeah. and then they basically Fatah took over the West right. Bank, and right. Hamas took over the Gaza Strip. But Bush, being not intelligent, uh, was like, "What? Hamas won." I thought oh, <laughs> our guys were gonna win. What happened, you right? Take I just gave him a bush hand, you know, <laughs> too, but uh, he was more like this. Hamas won. What happened? Right. Yeah, right? That's true. <laughs> uh, anyways, uh, so like we have a cartoonish image of Palestinians overall in America, mm -hmm. uh, let alone in getting into the nuance of uh, the upsides and downsides of Hamas. Like so, even that sentence will trigger people. Like, what do you mean upsides of Hamas? Well, Hamas runs the Gaza Strip. So and and even before they won the elections. Mm -hmm. Uh, they did healthcare, they Schools, did education, etc. Uh, yeah, and, and some of the education and propaganda it was terrible, and some of the education yeah. was math and science, right? So, um, and and uh, but on the other hand, they've done terrorist uh, attacks, and so that's the whole uh, range of Hamas. So, d did you talk about them in this show? Well, it's funny because the show really was an exploration of growing up Palestinian, but also then moving to the West Bank as an adult and mm -hmm. uh, after college and living. I arrived there uh, months before the Intifada started, mm -hmm. so I. So you triggered it. It was yeah, you. It was me. It was all me. Okay. And um, no wonder they're I'm mad taking at you. credit. Okay. Put it in the history books. They're like, they're like <laughs> Jennifer is here. Let her, let, Jennifer's here. Let us start. Okay. And I was like, let's do it. Okay. I'm here, I'm on the ground. 
Mm-hmm. I've got my running shoes. Let's go. <laughs> yeah, well, you would so, need those. I did. Oh, I did. Um, so I spent a year and a half living in the West Bank under occupation checkpoints. You know, really living the experience of being in uh, in living in an occupied territory. Like, oh, we're not going to work today. We can't get through the checkpoints. Okay, well, what are we going to do? Or we're not going to the grocery store. Or you're meeting a friend, but they're stuck on the other side of the checkpoint, and then it gets dangerous. So there. That experience really changed my my understanding of myself as a Palestinian, of the conflict, of the day to day experiences. And so the the show starts off like whimsical, and then it goes to like let's follow Jennifer to Palestine. Oh, she's at nightclubs. It's fabulous. Like there's a lot of Ramallah, where I was living, is um is a town that has like nightclubs and parties and drinking and bars. And so there's a, a lot of foreigners and it's a really social nightlife. So to be living this weird kind of international party lifestyle, but also then a month later be under occupation. We were under occupation before, but it wasn't strictly enforced in the same way. So, okay, there's so many interesting things there. I know, so let's, so much let's, going yeah, on. let's pause there to. to Talk about your time in in, uh, Ramallah. So first of all, Mm -hmm. why'd you go back to the West Bank? You know, this was at a point- I say back, but you never lived there. No, I never lived there. Yeah, why did you go Uh, there? Well, my family, I have this family tree that goes back there 500 years, and I can trace back. uh, I have a book that traces my family back to Ramallah, and um, on both my parents' sides. And I was at a point where I was starting my career, but there wasn't, you know, there wasn't that much going on. It was post-college, and I just thought it would, I really wanted to see where I was from. And especially when I went in 2008, it was this time when they thought, oh, there's gonna be a Palestinian state declared. There was like tons of building and development. A lot of Palestinian Americans were moving back, like starting businesses and opening hotels. So it was a, this really hopeful moment where it felt like, Exciting to be to be there and to explore my heritage and on the eve of something potentially monumental. Mm-hmm. And and obviously it didn't work out that way. So, you know, it's really hard for me to imagine what it is to live under occupation. So I've never been to the West Bank or Gaza mm-hmm. Strip, and so I, I and although I know the history of it and I know the politics of it. You know, I, I'm not sure I've ever talked to anyone who actually yeah. lived there under the occupation. Yeah. I've talked to reporters who've been there. Yeah. But so, how was it once once the Intifada began and the occupation really clamped down? Well, that it's interesting because I tell a lot of stories in my show about that because it was this kind of slow awakening for me of realizing. Um, because when I first got there, it's like, yeah, you drove through checkpoints, but Israelis came to Ramallah nightclubs. Mm-hmm. They snuck. They snuck in, and they were like, "Okay, let's just sneak through the checkpoint. It's fine." And they felt safe doing that. And they were like, "Ooh, it's cool. It's kind of slumming it. Let's go to Ramallah. Mm-hmm. You know, mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. cheap drinks, pre-party place." <laughs> so mm-hmm. it was this moment where there was this sense of like, "Yeah, there are still restrictions, and there's still a lot of uh, violence happening, but the restrictions were a little bit eased." Um, I think with the hope that the state was going to happen, and then as soon as uh, as soon as the Intifada started, within weeks, it's like they erected additional checkpoints. It's uh, there were soldiers inva- you know, dr- r- riding the jeeps into town and like shutting down. Stores were shut down for weeks. There was a curfew. Everything shut down at seven o'clock at night. Nobody could be on the street after seven p.m. So it went from this um, weird, fun exploring an international city to this feeling of like ongoing choking and oppression and your you your life just got smaller and smaller and smaller in terms of like how far you could go or where okay we're not going to work today because uh, all the checkpoints are up or they're adding additional like you know pop up checkpoints <laughs> it was like mm-hmm. my favorite like pop up checkpoint sorry you're not going the yeah. roads closed um, I mean so Gaza Strip is in worse shape than West Bank is oh, in the West Bank much 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 more worse. much but, more but even your description of the checkpoints give gives me a sense of how much of a prison it is. It's a prison and you're hearing shelling every night and friends are calling you at three in the morning going, oh my balcony just was, there's like, they're shelling my building. Can I come over and sleep at your house? Because I think that, you know, our glass doors are gonna be shattered any minute now. Right, so Hamas fires rockets into Israel and in the US we um, uh, hear all the time about 
how nervous and scared mm -hmm. the Israelis are of mm -hmm. the uh, the terrorists, etc. Now, I, I'm not trying to minimize it, right. but they they are literally small rockets, and very rarely does someone get hurt. They should never fire the rockets in the first place. It's a dumb thing to do morally. It's wrong. It's counterproductive. This is all my opinion, right? right. Uh, so, but. When Israel does shelling, those are not small rockets. Uh, no. So what is the feeling on the ground when there's shelling going on? Well, it's interesting because I started sleeping with earplugs at that time because it was impossible to go through a single night without hearing gunfire. Like mm -hmm. there's not a single night that you're not hearing, you know, shelling happening, buildings getting hit. I mean, you know, I, I remember sitting one day on our balcony and an F-16 just like flew right over our house and it was like phew, and then dropped a bomb on somebody's house maybe half a mile away and I was like, okay, what the hell, <laughs> like, what are you, but this that's is the outside thing, of my um, experience, ab ability to like, no, what do you do? And so you I see- I know what I do, that's the thing, Jennifer, I, I don't get it, like maybe you're way, and all those, most of them don't have a choice, right? Right. You're an American, so you had right. a choice. Right. Um, I'd pack my bags immediately because that bomb could have easily dropped on yeah. your building, right? So yeah. what do you, why did you stay? That feels, I mean, I, mean I, I don't know, maybe I'm just not as brave, but I'd been like, oh, they're dropping bombs on buildings, right. I'm gone. I mean, I, I think there are a few things. Number one, I went there, I had a few months, I had a job, I had a boyfriend, I was like, I had a community I was creating. It was exciting. I felt really attached to the country and to the vision. And I was like, this is this is where I want to be right now. And so, but so you and there was always a sense, and I think this is what is interesting, that Oh, maybe the violence is going to end in a few weeks. Oh, maybe you know the intifada didn't start in its like full scale. You know, it was like okay, we're going to have a pop up checkpoint here, but maybe it's going to be gone in three weeks. Nobody knew how long this was going to go on, but at, as it went on and on and escalated and escalated, it reaches a point where you're like, okay, this is craziness. <laughs> right. So, how does how do people get used to? Oh, the building a couple of blocks down was hit with a bomb and make up a number, whatever the number right. was, seven people died, right. 17 right. people died. They were like me and you, that was not a yeah. Hamas building, yeah, yeah, yeah. right? Yeah. Uh, I don't know how you ever get used to that. You don't, I mean, I think this is the interesting thing. I would say to my friends, they're like, what I, you know, I would be freaking out and they were like, yeah, building exploded. It's like, it's, it's if you're gonna freak out every time a building gets bombed, you're never gonna last here. <laughs> like, yeah, that was well. really the reality. And I think for them, it's people who get so. I mean, they they they're not gonna get a. They're not. First of all, none of them have passports. They're, they're not. A, you know, they're not a citizen of anywhere. They're not gonna just get up, get a visa, and get out of the country. Nobody's going anywhere. It's very difficult to travel. It's very difficult to ever leave. Um, yeah, you know, I, that's super interesting because uh, during the recent flare up in the Gaza Strip uh, with the protests, mm -hmm. um, I had this moment where I realized, oh, right, you know, we call it an open air prison and it is. Uh, but the, a lot of the people in the Gaza Strip have never even been in the West Bank. No. Because it's a prison, they can't you leave. Can't, you can't leave. And I for I never thought of it that way. And yeah. I was like, I assume they're Palestinians. I mean, my friends grew up in the West Bank and they have ne had never seen the ocean. They had never been to the ocean. That's amazing. They had never been to Jerusalem. Like they can't drive 20 minutes away <laughs> and see. So, um, how is it different being an American versus your friends who who and oh and by the way I should say like I didn't have that awakening until you just said it like I know that they don't have a state obviously we talk about mm -hmm. it all the time mm -hmm. uh, but that means they don't have a passport and yeah, that never occurred to me yeah uh, yeah so they can't so they can't I, leave they can't leave without Israel's permission so how do you get permission it's there is a process where you can apply to get permission to leave, but it's very, very difficult and very rare and uh -huh. can be denied at any point. Like you can be given the, the ability to leave and then two weeks before you're leaving, they can say, no, sorry, we're taking your permit, you can't leave, which happens to a lot of people. Yeah. Um, 
So you essentially uh, are trapped, you know? And so, it, I mean, for me, I think part of the reason I stayed is because I was like, wait, I'm starting to create these relationships and care about these people and they are not complaining and they can't go anywhere. And I have all the freedom in the world to get up and go anywhere I want. And so in a sense, it was like, I wanted to support them and experience that because I knew at any point I could leave. You can get permission, some of them can get permission to work inside of Israel, for example, right? Yes, um, yeah, some people. So that's that's the, probably the most common but thing. But you, it's hot, you have to have like this impeccable record. And, and what I realized while I was there during the Intifada is every kid is gonna be at the checkpoint throwing stones because what else do they have to do after school? They're like, they can't go anywhere. They have like very meager living conditions. They've got no job opportunities. They're never going to travel abroad. They're ne like, there's really no opportunity for them to have any sort of normal life. Yeah. And so, Tons of kids after school are like running over and the parents are like, what are you doing? Like I would see kids at checkpoint, like my neighbors. And I would be like rolling down the window, like go home. Like what are you doing here? Mm -hmm. 12 year old kid, 10 year old kid who are throwing stones at armed soldiers. I know that 12 year old kid is now a 22 year old who's still living under the occupation. Right, but because that 12 year old kid got arrested and now has a police record, there are very, it's, it's a lot more difficult to ever get the ability to travel abroad or ever get permission to go work in Israel or go moved. I mean, I knew people who were married to people in a different city. My friends in Ramallah, his brother was married to a woman in Jerusalem. He couldn't live in Jerusalem with her. She mm -hmm. had to come into Ramallah to visit him, but she didn't wanna give up her Jerusalem residency because it has more, um, more rights. So she's like, I'm not giving up my Jerusalem residency. And he kept applying and couldn't get Jerusalem residency. So they lived in separate towns and just visited. She visited. When you say different rights, that oh, reminds yeah. me of, of all places, Charleston, South Carolina. The reason mm -hmm. I say that is because I went there a little over a year ago. Mm -hmm. And and I, uh, of course, being the curious guy that I am, I went uh, and researched its history while I was there. And I went to a bunch of museums mm -hmm. and et cetera. And it was interesting, the the hierarchy that was created by slavery, and right. how uh, if you were a one eighth white or a quarter white or a half white, right. the different rights that you had, right? right? And and it was it was uh, different prestige, different rights, uh, and and people knew it, and they were they had all yeah. these different names, et cetera, et cetera, right? So what rights do you have if you're a Palestinian living in Jerusalem versus one living in West Bank? Well, first of all, you have different license plates, different mm -hmm. colored license plates. So Jerusalem, like Jerusalem cars can go to the West Bank and into Israel. West Bank cars cannot drive into Jerusalem or mm -hmm. Israel. Mm -hmm. So um, you have mobility if you're a Jerusalem resident. You can go anywhere in the in Israel. So those license plates Bank. are valuable. The license plates are valuable, number one. But you also have a different residency. West Bank residents versus Jerusalem residents versus citizens of Israel versus Gaza. So mm -hmm. there's four designations as Palestinians um, that you can have. And of course, obviously being a citizen of Israel gives you the most but you don't just, there's no way to become a citizen of Israel unless you were born there. Mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. And even marrying a, an Israeli, you cannot get, they they need to rescind their rights, you don't gain their rights, essentially. I'm telling you, it's, if you, <laughs> you, go, you go to a museum and read up on, Amer on American history yeah. and you will see similar things. Yeah. Uh, a, a white person could lose their rights, but a black person couldn't gain they their could rights. They could never gain them, yes. Right. So as a Palestinian, you're never gonna gain any right. Uh, you, you can, the highest rights you can get are Jerusalem rights, which mm -hmm. is like, the, but still you're not considered a citizen and still you're not given, like you have more mobility and more ability to get work, et cetera, but you're still like, it's not full. Okay. It's a crazy hierarchy and there's so many intricacies and ins and outs. I am not an expert on it, but what yeah. I do know is, I mean, when I went in, I was. they were like, do you have Palestinian citizenship? This is the other thing, it's not even citizenship, but do you have a, a Palestinian identity card? Because mm -hmm. if you're a foreigner whose parents got you a Palestinian identity card, then you rescind your foreign rights and you are now considered a holder of that Palestinian identity card and those are your rights. So you are not an American citizen in 
Ramallah who gets arrested. You are now a Palestinian resident of the West Bank who gets arrested, whether or not you hold American citizenship. Oh, wow. Yeah. So, so you can lose your rights as an American almost. Well, you lose your in rights that in, ter- moment, in that, that moment, place. yes, in terms of how you are designated by the state of Israel. Interesting. Yeah. So if, if I don't have a Palestinian identity card, FYI. So. Yeah. Well, who who would get one under those circumstances? Here, here's here an ID go. card. You lose all now your you lose all your rights. Oh, thank you. There I you really go. appreciate it. Now we're going to take you into jail, yeah. and no one will ever hear from you again. Yeah. So if you're living in Ramallah, uh, can you say, "Hey, I'd like to move to Jerusalem," and assume that you? No, no, you're never going to move to Jerusalem. But like, assume you have a perfectly clean record no. and et cetera. No, never. You cannot move it's to Jerusalem. It's not going to happen. Okay. You're gonna live in your same town that you lived in for the rest of your life. The best you could do is move from a small town in the West Bank to Ramallah. That's the most cosmopolitan town. That's it. That's the best you're ever gonna do. And and let's say you decided you want to go to Sweden. Can oh. you? Well, yeah. If you get if you have a, an insanely clean record, if you don't have any sort of, then you can go to Sweden. But are you gonna? Are you? You may not be able to come back. <laughs> Why? Why can't you come back? There's like <laughs> I don't know that you'd want to. But I don't think you'd want to. Right. But travel is really difficult for Palestinians. It's so, incredibly difficult. I mean, if you can traveling to Egypt, traveling to Jordan, traveling to the other countries in the Arab world is less difficult if you go through the borders with those countries and you're not flying out of Israel. So depending mm-hmm. where you leave. It's also, mm-hmm. you have more, but it's also depending on the political climate. Before the Intifada started, people are like, okay, come to Jordan, that's cool. Mm-hmm. Now, I don't know, I don't know how we, <laughs> yeah. how welcoming they are. Um, hmm, that's interesting too. So being a Palestinian, yeah. you are living in this situation where your rights just as a citizen of the world are so narrow. Mm-hmm. And your ability yeah. to actually experience the world and ever go anywhere. So, what made you come back? Oh, I think after a year and a half, I was like, I can't. I was so, it was so difficult because I didn't grow up going, okay, I am never gonna go anywhere. Uh-huh. That a year and a half of not being able to ever go anywhere finally wore me down. A year and a half of violence, a year and a half of sitting in a taxi at a checkpoint watching soldiers shoot at children, throwing right. rocks. I mean, so uh, oftentimes, including in the recent flare up, the Fox News of the world. So the right wing mm-hmm. here and the right wing in Israel, of course, do the same thing, which is, uh, no, we had to kill them, right. uh, they made us do it. So, uh, and one of the most common uh, things they say is uh, Hamas is hiding in the schools and hiding in right. the hospitals <laughs> and hiding in every building, and they're using uh, the Palestinians as human shields. Right. So, you were there. What was what was your sense of how true or untrue that is? I mean, really, you don't have. I'm, there is no ability to write your own narrative. It's the narrative is written depending on what the occupying force decides is the situation, and mm-hmm. that's what gets leaked to the media, and that's the story that it goes with, and what actually. I would so many times on the ground be a, a protest at the university or somewhere where I would watch the Western media later and see the way it was covered and was like, that's, I was physically there. I was taking pictures. That's absolutely not what happened on the ground. But mm-hmm. the way that it's- Like what would happen? What would they report as? I mean, I just think the way it's con- it's constantly reported as you know, clashes with uh, terrorists, with violent individuals. And sometimes these were just kids or students or people who were actually non-violently protesting and then stun stun, uh, grenades and tear gas canisters were being shot and uh, rubber bullets were being shot and people were actually being injured when they were protesting. Some, yes, some people were throwing rocks in some of these situations, yes. Mm. But nobody was armed. Mm -hmm. These are heavily armed. Military personnel yeah. dealing with like college students with you know signs and yeah. throwing rocks. Uh, if it wasn't so horrific, I'd be amused by the idea of someone in an F-16 and a tank right. saying, "Why are you right. armed with a stone?" Right. 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 Well, you're in an Abrams tank. Uh, right. I'm yeah. pretty sure <laughs> that you're at- slightly more armed than I am. Uh, and and you know, this is a again, it's a serious situation and it's a goofy analogy, but. Right. 
I, I always think, unfortunately, and as you're describing, I certainly thought it again, of the beginning of Gladiator when uh, when Maximus is talking to the other general about why the Germans won't, the German uh, barbarians in that scene, uh, why they won't give up. And, and the general who's the bad guy goes, people should know when they are conquered. And, and the yeah. hero of the movie, Maximus, turns to him and goes, would you? Right. Would I? Right. right? And, and as the Palestinians yeah. go to seek statehood in the United Nations, hence seek diplomacy, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. or they go to do protests at the universities, or they throw rocks, or they do violence, right? right? Under all the scenarios, the US and Israel turns and says, people should know when they are conquered, right? right? And, and so, okay, I, when? When does the occupation ever end? No, no. How no, could it end? No. Has, has Israel or the United States ever said, okay, if you do this, this, and this, right. we will end the occupation? And they, you know, they, and every time they move the bar, they said, okay, recognize yeah. the existence of Israel. Even Hamas said, okay. Yeah, okay, we'll recognize we'll do it. That. Okay. And they're like, <laughs> they uh, did that. no, I meant recognize it as a Jewish state that you will live under. Oh, well, then I'm back right. in the occupation. Yeah. yeah so, yeah, well, yeah. okay. So as long as you admit that you should live in occupation forever, We'll lift the occupation, which means we won't, right. because then you'll still be in occupation. Right. What? Right. <laughs> right. There's a it's never maddening. Ending. It's never ending. Yeah. <laughs> There's so, no escape. So I don't know how much you saw Hamas in the West Bank because they're centered no. in the Gaza Strip. So do you have an impression of Hamas? I mean, you know, this is the way that I feel. Like you, there was a very apt analogy you just made. I think that under circumstances, and that is a lot of what I actually talked about in the show. It's like, okay, Jennifer's whimsical, she goes to Palestine, everything is a fun party, things get a little dark, and slowly over time we start seeing it getting deeper and deeper. And where do you reach the point where you break and then you say, Fuck it, I'm gonna carry out a suicide bombing. I'm going to become an armed soldier. I'm going to fight this with everything I have because I have no other choices. So I feel like there's so many levels of resistance to occupation and I don't know people's hearts and I don't, but I do know as a human being, people break and just say, that's enough. I'm going to take a violent route. And other people go, no, I'm just gonna create a business and create infrastructure and hope that things change and that I can start you know, creating a future. So there are so many different ways that people choose to live under those circumstances. And what I realize there is I cannot, as an outsider, decide what is legitimate as a choice to resist a situation where you are literally stifled and every moment of your life is controlled. Yeah, I, I often uh, use, it, back when we talked about it a lot more often, it would use Texas as an analogy. Imagine if Texas was occupied uh, right. by Mexico or Russia, these days they might they celebrate. They probably are. <laughs> yeah, maybe they are these already. Days right? they probably are. Yeah, um, <laughs> Probably oh, by Russia, though. Right, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah, no, they probably celebrate their uh, occupation under Russia. Trump told us this was All great. Right. This is right. awesome, yeah. We're right on schedule. <laughs> right, but, but if, if Texas was really occupied by a foreign army, right. what do you think the Texans would do? Oh. Do you think they might resort to violence in their Second Amendment rights? And, and do you think they'd pick up their guns? Or they'd be like, oh no, we're under occupation. No, uh, here's my guns. No, I, I, I won't fight back, I promise. Right. I mean, just right. think about that for a second. So now look, I, but I want to be uh, careful to say it over right. and over again. It is not the right thing to do. Right. It's both not productive and not moral and not any of those things. It's not gonna work. So one of the, the striking right. quotes that I found from Mahatma Gandhi that, that I didn't know uh, mm -hmm. uh, until relatively recently was, uh, and I don't know if it, uh, takes away some respect from Gandhi in a sense, but he said, well, I would have fought the British with guns if we had more guns, right? <laughs> right? <laughs> but we didn't, yeah, but we, right? Yeah, exactly. And so you know, you take that anywhere you like, but as a matter of strategy, he's absolutely right. Do right. not fight with right. guns, it's a terrible idea. They have F-16s, right? So, and every time right. that uh, any Palestinian does an act of terrorism, it is used to justify the yes, occupation. Definitely. 
Uh, on the other hand, they would justify it no matter what. <laughs> right. I mean, look, there's a huge uptick in the last decade, and it has been happening for decades. But in the last decade, especially in a nonviolent resistant movement, and I think this Ahad Tamimi is an example of this girl whose family is in, um, oh my God, it, what is the name of their village? I can't believe I just forgot it. But okay. she's, she's a young girl who, who has been all over the media, who is a 17 year old girl who slapped a soldier. And what happened is their village, uh, they live in a village that the, um, they basically said, okay, you can keep your village, but we're gonna take the water source. We're taking the well because we're building a settlement over here. So sorry, this isn't your water source anymore. And they're like, this is our well. You can't take the entire water source of this village. And so that family and that village has been every Friday for years going to the checkpoints, going to the well, and doing nonviolent protests. They are met with tear gas, they are met with rubber bullets. They are, um, her cousin was shot in the head. Um, her with other a rubber cousin bullet or? With a rubber bullet, but has severe brain damage. Her other cousin was uh, shot recently and killed. Uh, I think this was several weeks ago. And so it's an entire family that has been, uh, an entire village that has been practicing nonviolence, re, nonviolent resistance, and they are being targeted. They are being every member of her family has been arrested. She was the most recent. She she was sixteen when she ended up. Uh, a soldier came onto her property the day that they had just shot her cousin in the head, who was in the hospital with brain damage, and she pushed him and slapped him in the face, and mm -hmm. then she now is serving eight months in prison as a seventeen-year-old. Yeah. There's no. a similar story of a settler who slapped a soldier in the face and got no prison time. So of course, it's like of course. Um, even when you're carrying out nonviolence resistance, that is a threat to the Israeli government and it is painted as no, no, terrorism. The, the lie of the right wing Israeli government was exposed when the Palestinians went to the UN. And they said, How dare you go to the UN to seek a state? Right. That's what Israel did to yeah. become Israel. Right. So what do you mean, how dare you do that? Wait, do you want them to do terrorism instead? They're doing diplomacy. Right. And then the BDS movement. They're like, the BDS movement oh. is anti-Semitic. What, wait a minute, what are you talking about? If you say terrorism is bad, I'm 100% with you. Violence against civilians, no, I'm with you. That's terrible, right? Mm -hmm. But if you say you also cannot do an economic movement, because that bothers me a little bit and it might cost yeah. me a couple of dollars. No, no, that's not anti-Semitic. Then you're <laughs> right. saying that people should know when they're occupied. Yes. Right? And they should live in that occupation forever mm -hmm. and they should never fight back in under any never circumstances. Never non-violently resist, never economic resistance, never no, just stop. Accept your <laughs> resistance, accept that you're conquered. Yeah, and the reason they get most mad, the right wing does about the BDS movement oh. is because it might work. It might. Uh, 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 that's what stopped apartheid in South Africa. That's true. When they did economic resistance and all of a sudden, uh, it's a little uncomfortable, so forget it. We'll we'll Maybe. Uh, free people. So anyway, now back to uh, the attacks against you. So right. you do this show, and it's actually about your life, and it, you're a comedian, and and you, we just found out your real opinions. So obviously that's expressed in your show. Right. right. And then all of a sudden, out of nowhere, years later, yes, <laughs> in, in March of this year, apparently, yes. what happens? So I. Um, Actually, I receive a tweet. I see a tweet in May that's saying that um, I am a supporter of terrorism, and here is a whole profile about me. And so, of course, I, <laughs> I go to see what's going on, and um, there is an entire full-page profile with. Uh, extensive research about Facebook posts I've written, articles and interviews that have happened, um, articles I've written, interviews uh, with me about my show dating back to 2007, um, and basically uh, and pictures, uh, social media links, basically are articulating that I support terrorism, that I'm romanticizing terrorism, that I am demonizing Israel and the US. Um, and so people start tweeting their support of this organization and they're basically it's a blacklist where they've profiled on their website um, 
over, I think about 2,000 activists, artists, students, uh, and professors. And it started really focusing on on-campus activity. Um, anyone who has had any sort of pro-Palestinian stance. How dare they? Publicly, right. yes. Yeah. So and people should know when they're people conquered. People should know when they're uh, conquered. Uh, you have a pro pro human stance of Palestinians. Right, right. We got to put you on a blacklist. So then people start tweeting things like, "Great, I'm going to make sure she never gets booked. Let's shut down her shows. Let's find out where she's going to be." You know, a little bit. It's getting a little scary at this point. You know, it, it almost sounds like they're trying to terrorize you. Oh, maybe, maybe <laughs> they're trying to terror. Maybe they're trying to terrorize. Yeah. <laughs> so. Um, you know, I I was actually really jarred that that this could happen because That's not the point only of is it the way that they portrayed my work as a it, they they even went so far as to say as an actor on Transparent she played a character that had a pro Palestine like Israel hating stance and I was like I got hired as an actor. I didn't write the show. <laughs> like I mm -hmm. read the lines I was given. You're using that as supporting evidence that I am supporting terrorism. Yeah, um, <laughs> I was once an actor who was in a Hubcap Heaven commercial. There you go. I actually have never been to Hubcap Heaven. Are you sure? <laughs> Are I've you never sure? been to heaven of any sort, let alone a <laughs> Hubcap one. Um, so right. besides which. Um, you know, it is possible to love Palestinians and Israelis at the same time. It is possible to be pro-Palestine right. and and not hate Israel, and and to right. believe that what's best for Israel is a two-state solution. Well, I know that blows the right wing's minds. Or a one-state solution. <laughs> You're in favor of one state. I I'm am definitely a not. But huge proponent of one democratic state. Yeah. For all peoples. That they will never agree to that. It's totally unrealistic. It's and the nor only, would I do it's it. The only solution in uh -huh. my mind. Yeah. That makes sense. Two states, for God's sake, separate, yeah. get freedom. Okay, <laughs> all right, so we disagree on Where that. Where would those states be? It doesn't make any sense. Palestinian Gaza Strip, East Jerusalem. I'm what done you, with is it. there going to be a super highway <laughs> from Gaza to, yeah, to the West Bank? We do whatever, Where is that going to be? Whatever highway you need to do to make that happen, trade a little bit of 4% land here and there. There's already a peace deal. Everybody already what? knows what 4%? the deal is. We've, they've already taken almost all the. Right. Uh, so well, it's it's very complex. Okay, without getting into the whole uh, into peace negotiations so, okay, here, we're right? having it. We're going right. to do it tonight. <laughs> Actually, but, this is never ending. We're going to do this tonight. Right. So, but look, you got a lot of supporters and and friends that are also in comedy and etc. So mm -hmm. Sarah Silverman, mm -hmm. uh, and did she get blowback for? Uh, having for liking you, or what happened there? Well, she she and I have been trading some some tweets recently, and she's been you know just kind of questioning some things, and she's been attacked as anti-Semitic and anti-Israel, <laughs> and so which is so funny because she's like the quintessential Jew. Yeah, <laughs> I, mean, I know. Sarah's like, I love you, Sarah, but she's the quintessential Jew. So, yeah. but that's her act. That's, that's her. Yeah, that's yeah, her whole I mean, thing. That's so like saying to, uh, Seinfeld's anti-Semitic. Right. So to be so heavily. <laughs> trolled for just putting, you know, retweeting some articles or saying, "Hey, this doesn't seem right. I'm not I'm not in favor of this." All of a sudden, she was really heavily trolled and uh and she, you know, retweeted me, mentioned me in a couple of tweets and I and that was like, you know, right around February. So I feel like it was, you know, a lot maybe a lot of Oh, because some blow she blowback from some of her. I see. You found out in May, but Sarah Silverman retweeted you in February, so oh, this might have started no, in March. No, no, no. There is actually on the profile it says that it was put up in March. Okay. 2017. They just took two months to let me know. Oh, I see. <laughs> okay. So only a little bit of time left. So where is that controversy now? I mean, so they're still trying to blacklist you in different well, places, I mean, and what's happening? You have to think. This is kind of terrifying. They're putting people on a blacklist, claiming they support terrorism, uh, saying they have attempted to get people fired. They have had, uh, and this is an anonymous group. We don't know who's behind this website. We don't know who's supporting it. They come up very high in searches. So if you're a college student, for example, who went to a protest and then you were named on this blacklist, you went to a pro-Palestine protest. When you're applying to grad school, when you're applying to your first job, the first thing that's coming up is John Smith supports terrorism. Oh my God. You know what I mean? So it's a way to intimidate people, to threaten people, to
to put them on this McCarthyist blacklist to say, like, back off, stop supporting this. You know, it's a way to silence people. You know, you know what it sounds like to me, Jennifer? It looks like they brought the occupation here. Yeah, to the to, to the interwebs. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, uh, I, I want to thank you for being brave and speaking out. Thank you. And uh, and uh, and we will fight back against the blacklists, and we will fight back against this oppression, and against the occupation, and we'll do it the right ways through diplomacy and politics, etc. And I don't know when it's gonna happen, but I, I do believe, I'm an optimist, and I believe we can get there. And I think the new generation of Americans, American Jews in particular, yeah. are leading the way. And I think Definitely. that they're wonderful and, and made a huge difference. And I, and I see great hope there. And I think that they could help to rescue the situation. And they're not gonna get intimidated by the old right wing of either here or Israel or anywhere else. Uh, and and I think we will get to the right answer, but God, it is frustratingly slow. Yes, it is, and it is. It's frustrating to be, uh, you know, to be in to be in a situation where you're a creative person and you're voicing opinions, and you're getting shut down, silenced, intimidated, and in a sense, like you said, terrorized for saying I don't support what's happening. Yeah. All right, uh, now don't forget, Jennifer actually does comedy. I do, I'm <laughs> so. funny, I really am, I swear. So it's, she just got stuck in this situation and it's a fascinating <gasps> story. But JenniferJajay.com, we'll have the link down below, check out her uh, upcoming uh, shows. Perfect. Uh, Jennifer, thanks so much for joining us, Thank really you so appreciate much. it. If you like the interview that you just watched, I got great news for you. If you become a Young Turks member, you can watch them live as they happen. Only the members get that. You also get Young Turks live. You also get Aggressive Progressive live and Old School live. Everything is available for the members and commercial free. tytnetwork.com slash join.